is Jessica Schnepp. I'm a PhD candidate in English at the Catholic University of America and the founder of Contemporary Catholic Writers, or CCW for short, a reading and discussion group that aims to raise awareness and foster appreciation of literary works by today's Catholic writers, including and especially the writers at this conference. I'm joined here by my colleagues, Jonathan Wanner, Robert Sharon, and Bethany Besteman. All of them are also PhD candidates at Catholic University, and all of them are actively involved in participating in and running uh, the, the Contemporary Catholic Writers Group. At the risk of appearing self-indulgent, I'd like to give some personal background to CCW. The seed that would eventually become the Contemporary Catholic Writers Group was planted well before I started graduate school at CUA. In 2007, just after finishing college, I read The Life You Save May Be Your Own, Paul Eli's brilliant portrait of Dorothy Day, Merton, O'Connor, and Percy, and the mid-century Catholic literary culture at that time. The book left me wondering where to find a community of writers like that today, writers equally serious about faith and literary craft, and equally compelling to religious and secular readers. At the time, I had no idea where to look. I would literally type into Google, Catholic writers today, or contemporary Catholic writers, every month, hoping to find the community I was looking for. I consider it providential that Dana Joya's essay, The Catholic Writer Today, appeared just as, as I was beginning graduate school in 2013, and that another serendipitous Google search led me to the first Catholic Imagination Conference in California in 2015. For me, that conference was electric. So many Catholic writers in one place. I felt like I had come home after being lost for a very long time. I left the conference with a fresh reading list and an urgent need to include CUA in the conversation. With faculty support, my fellow English graduate students and I founded the CUA Contemporary Catholic Writers Group in the fall of 2015. Since then, and thanks to the enormous generosity of writers who have encouraged our efforts, we host frequent guest lectures, poetry and fiction readings, film screenings, and monthly book discussions for the university community and the general public. In our own small corner of the world, we're building the kind of community that we've always wanted to see. But this doesn't mean our group, whose members are both academic and not, both Catholic and not, doesn't mean it's univocal or isn't without its challenges. In fact, I believe it's the differences and sometimes strong but respectful disagreement within the group that keeps it alive and growing. The reading group gives special attention to the work of contemporary American Catholic writers, but we've also expanded our focus to include more international writers, past Catholic writers, and current writers from other faith traditions, as well as those of ambiguous faith who are nonetheless, as Walker Percy would say, onto something. This means we read Flannery O'Connor alongside Marilyn Robinson, Alice McDermott with Eugene Vodolaskin, James Matthew Wilson with Louise Erdrich and John Darnell. In this way, we take an inductive approach to the question, what is Catholic literature, in an attempt to ensure an ongoing search for a less reductive, less ghettoizing, more multivocal, and hopefully more fruitful understanding of the Catholic literary imagination. That's the radical center, to steal Mike Murphy's term, the delicate balance we aim for it often raises more questions than it does answers, but that's what keeps the discussion going. So let's get started. We'll first have Jonathan Wanner come up, who I should say is also uh, one of the creative writers in the group. Jonathan? What separates the Michael O'Briens and Alice McDermott's of this world from no-namers? If you think it's innovation, you've drunk the proverbial Kool-Aid. As tempting as it is to view innovation and tradition at indirect opposition, the more complex reality is that the two are necessarily intertissued. It has always been the case that humans follow traditions of innovations, even as they innovate traditions. Every few years, school-aged children create new slang. Their words sound new, but they're just different versions of old slang words awesome, or rad, or lit. They're different versions of the same word, 
Same thing with intensifiers. So cool becomes, you know, mad cool or wicked cool. And in five years or maybe even next year, there will be a new intensifier that is popular among, among um, you know, school kids. Real innovation would be slang for crystal clear or one step at a time. These phrases that we commonly use all the time, but don't, you know, don't ever renew or not usually. Can't windows, though, be ca California sky clear? Can't speakers be more original if they redesign common phrases and words one stride at a time? Not if you want to be among the popular and known Catholic writers. Why is it that aspiring writers, Catholic writers, fail to publish? It is because they can't persuade their audience that they have succeeded. In many cases, it is because too much innovation doesn't conform to common publishing criteria. If you want sales, uh, uh, be like O'Brien and McDermott. They succeed because rather than trying to recreate genres and artistic boundaries, they persuade publishers and readers that they fulfill old expectations with a slightly new twist. Whether you're a Catholic writer or a writer who happens to be Catholic, if your goal is to be popular and if you're struggling to get readers, it might not be because of what you're saying, but because of how you're saying it and who you're saying it to. If your stories or poems aren't getting on shelves, it may be that you need to reroute your tra rhetorical trajectory. What aspiring authors often forget is that writing is a rhetorical act, not you know, in every respect, but largely so. Reading is largely a rhetorical act. And when a Catholic writer ignores this fact, it can be the difference between their voice being read or remaining dead. So how exactly is literature rhetorical? AKA, how does it intend to persuade? Aren't students rather taught that fiction should not persuade? Since the 1920s, the maxim show don't tell has become the catch-all phrase of writers and critics. A limb of this idea is the common saying that writers shouldn't preach, they should tell a good story. Most of the time, this is not bad advice for students whose fiction is so explicitly didactic that it fails to persuade. After all, the more bluntly we lisp debatable claims, the more likely a reader will respond with hostility. The alternative students are taught is to describe. Conveniently, a description of physical details makes no statement about religion or politics. Ergo, a description shows people facts and allows the reader to, the space to come up with their own opinions. Right? Not at all. Description may appear to be a pacifist dream, but there is just as much disagreement and conflict in a literary description as there is in a direct, plain opinionated speech. The difference is that description is a magician who hides opinions in his top hat and behind his cufflinks. Take the following passage from Tim Gautreaux's Idols. Julian went inside out of the late June heat and sat in his duct-taped recliner. Julian doesn't sit in any recliner in this passage. It's a duct-taped recliner, a fact that is also an opinion, since it implies that he's either cheap or thrifty, good or bad. Here's another description of Julian. One rainy day, Julian and his hired hand, Obi, sat under the wavering glow of a shortening light fixture, while Obi feebly complained about how little Julian was paying him. Sounds like Julian is cheap to me. Obi later says of Julian, he sent me to town in his car to get tar and took the gas out of my pay. By descriptively showing Julian is cheap, Gautreau implicitly judges him. We read the rest of the story closely. We find further implicit claims. Julian cares too much about his reputation when he inherits the mansion. He looks down on people who don't have college degrees like him, even though he went to a community college and no prestigious institution. Because Julian is prideful, he doesn't follow the advice of the store clerk or Obi, his hired hand. And as a consequence, his house burns down. The moral of these actions is quite clear. By idolizing his mansion, Julian actually idolizes himself. He worships his own reputation, career, and opinions. And we know this because Gautreaux very clearly, descriptively shows us again and again. 
Such a summary doesn't capture the entire meaning of the story, but what it reveals is that moral judgments are a real part of every narrative reading experience. Narrative description always has a gavel. If it didn't, it would fail to captivate. If a story never suggested anything is wicked or dangerous or mistaken, the reader would feel no fear or anxiety or shame. If a story never implied anyone is good or safe or right, the reader would not have any reason to feel pity or joy. In the case of Gautreaux's idols, the story actively persuades the reader not to be like Julian. Julian is selfish, Obi is charitable. Julian has a short temper, Obi is patient. Julian is foolish, Obi is wise. Julian builds up his idol until, uh, until his house burns down, uh, while Obi burns down his idols to build up his character. Translation, Julian equals bad, Obi equals good. Don't be Julian, be Obi. But of course, saying it the way that I just did, plainly and directly, is not as fun or experiential as reading the story. The story indeed is more persuasive, and it provides readers with more than just a moral opinion. It shows them how to simply behold the divine and rest in its vision. And it does this by giving charity and humility a flesh, obi. The purpose of literature is, of course, not only to teach moral lessons, but Catholic writers are in denial if they believe they can achieve alternative purposes of literature, such as contemplation and higher senses of leisure, by avoiding moral suggestions altogether. All narratives, after all, involve a series of choices and outcomes. How the author describes those choices and outcomes suggests whether the reader should feel good, bad, or ambivalent about them. By showing readers how to feel, a writer subtly suggests whether the reader should defend or prosecute choices. When we consider how connotation governs description, the matter becomes even more complex. After all, the word redneck could be an insult or a compliment. There's a planet of a difference between saying, of course he's a bigot, he's a redneck, and Sawyer fixed my truck with a fork, that there's redneck ingenuity. In both examples, associations audibly establish expectations. When I say, of course he's a bigot, he's a redneck, I'm sending echolocation signals to the audience, which say, I'm likely from the city, I might shop organic, I'm probably a liberal. Because I use the word redneck pejoratively and accuse someone of, from the country of being a bigot. If I said that their Sawyer has redneck ingenuity, the message of the echolocation changes. I'm probably from the South. I'm definitely from the country. I'm conservative and probably some kind of Christian. Because there's evidence for these claims, the name Sawyer is far more common in the South, and that there is a common country phrase. However, we don't always think through this evidence like I'm doing now. More often, our response is automatic, intuitively inflected by background experiences and beliefs. If my experiences and beliefs associate the country with words like faith and family, and the comforts of privacy and silence, then it's no wonder that my body might respond with warm affection. If, on the other hand, my experiences repeatedly associate country folks with stupidity, hate, and self-righteousness, then I will respond to those connotative associations. If you're Catholic, the word Eucharist might just light a glow bug in your heart. So too, ideas associated with the word, transubstantiation, thanksgiving, superpowers of grace, may fill the mind with smiles and high fives. Who then would expect a Catholic to agree with the statement, it's just a piece of bread? Someone who clearly doesn't know their audience. But normal non-Catholic Joe down the street doesn't know what transubstantiation means. When a Catholic writer says Eucharist, Joe might be imagining only a rotund piece of bread that people eat at church. He might associate zero ideas with the image, or he might disagree with transubstantiation. He might consider that circle of bread to be a tremendous agitation because he associates it with cannibalism. When non-Catholic Joe hunches over the Lord of the Rings, he does not equate lumbus bread with the Eucharist like Tim I'm the next Tolkien does. Of course not. They, they have different educations, different expectations, ideas, and feelings about the, the word Eucharist. If Joe and Tim were to talk about the Eucharist, they would be relying on different circuit boards of associations. Experiences matter to the Catholic writer. Beliefs matter to the Catholic writer because they matter to all writers, because they determine how writers and readers 
feel about words and respond to them. So taking into account this practical information about connotation, we can look at a few do's and don'ts if we want to try to imitate the Alice McDermott's of this world. How is it that they achieve connotation in a way that is, uh, makes the job of the reader more clear and accessible? After all, people, the average person doesn't want to read you know, Ulysses because James Joyce is creating a whole new network of associations for the reader. They want to go to their normal connotative webs that they're used to and get those affirmed by uh, uh, popular writers so that they feel understood, so that they feel affirmed. Here are a few ways to achieve that. Number one, do be aware of binaries. If you're trying to appeal to a specific audience, you know, like those ca authors who are writing to Catholics specifically, choose images and words which will clearly favor the same binaries that your audience favors. Michael O'Brien knows that traddy Catholics like blood, relics, Latin, and liturgical gestures, and that's why he fills Father Elijah with those images. And you could say the same about the awakening of Miss Prim uh, uh, and other authors like that. If you're trying to appeal, however, to a more general mainstream audience, you, will, you would need to choose images and words which have no strong connotations. Uh, or if you do favor some connotations, you should favor the near past over the diff distant past, favor casual language over formal language, favor uh, more liberal ideas versus over conservative ideas because this is what we repeatedly see in New York Times bestsellers. It's kind of a formula. You see that in Alec McDermott, Alice McDermott and Tim Gautreaux. Uh, neither of them are especially, you know, obviously liberal per se, but both of them have a lot of everyday words. They use common language. It's not like they use special archaic literary terms. Uh, they both, well, Alice McDermott at least, does subvert the past in select moments. In the novel Someone, Gabriel comes out of the closet. In The Ninth Hour, the nun at the beginning of the story says, well, weren't they so evil back then because they didn't... Uh, you know, bury people who committed suicide. It's, it's favoring the new over the old. It's signaling to readers, I'm like you, don't worry. Uh, you challenge the, the past, I challenge the past too. That's her readers, that's the mainstream audience. She's just accommodating them so that they feel affirmed. Uh, same thing with Tim Gautreau. He writes with stock characters, uh, the self-isolating pr professor, the man who, who lacks common sense. Because he focuses on common, everyday vices, he, he can stay away from politics and religious issues and focus on these basic faults. Tip number two, do follow conventions. Don't be too innovative with word choice and word order. Again, Michael O'Brien, Alice McDermott, Tim Groutreau frequently favor common, everyday words like thin, walked, and house. These words are hardly remarkable. They're at times very general, but they're clear and easy. And most of the time, that's a great help to readers who are very tired, they come home from work, and they maybe just want a little bit of relaxation. It's not going to make these works a part of the literary canon, but most popular um, uh, novels don't get there. That's not the point. These authors are rather uh, uh, being polite to the reader by making the associations very simple and easy for them. The structure of the narratives also are easy to follow. Even There are memories and flashbacks, but they're not really confusing. It's not like Sound and the Fury. It's an easy job for the reader to follow the story. Tip number three, do be okay with having a smaller audience if you imitate non-contemporary, non-trendy literary forms. I, Dwight Longenecker and Mary Eberstadt, for example, wrote books that intentionally imitate the screw tape letters. The satire in these stories is rather direct. It, that's not a trend night right now because mainstream audiences feel Catholics who are more vocal uh, about traditional ideas are hostile. This doesn't mean that these books are unsuccessful or that they shouldn't write them, but that they should be okay with having a very niche Catholic audience who has more traditional values and uh, that they share. That's okay, they just need to be okay with that. Uh, and then number four, don't expect your readers to close read your book like a college professor close reads Shakespeare. We can go back to Tolkien Tim. He, uh, you know, you can do what Tolkien did and you can suddenly mention dates of Marian solemnities. You can cloak the Eucharist in lawness bread, but unless your audience is the literary Catholic class who likes to scout around for secrets, doing those things will not get you more readers. Now, this is a difficult point to accept 
And uh, you know, I I create right. I don't intend to stop doing these witty things. I don't intend to to stop making allusions and puns and subtle you know word games. But I need to recognize as an author that these are not going to get me more readers, but maybe a few clicky followers. And finally, my final tip is do read contemporary Catholic writers. You can't follow current trends if you don't know what they are. If you want your book to be popular, those trendy publications, treat them as magic mirrors. They tell you what people want and what they expect from books. You can sit and complain that Michael O'Brien books have unremarkable and common diction and syntax, like I did a little bit ago, that they use cheap emotional tactics to keep readers turning pages, that, there's, you know, that some authors might be selling their true convictions in order to make sales, but they're doing the practical thing, and if that's your goal too, you can imitate them. I, but of course there is this larger question, how much should we value popularity? Uh, you know, how much should we even care about it? When is sacrificing innovation for ease and comfort too great a sacrifice? When should we follow traditions of innovation? And when should we innovate those very traditions of innovation? And those are some questions I leave for you because I, I think it is a common sentiment for aspiring writers to feel, oh, I don't have readers but I have so much to say and I've been studying for so many years and I learned all the tricks that Dunn did, you know, all the paradoxes that he uses. He has this tripartite Augustinian structure to his, you know, poems. I did that too here, but people aren't paying attention to me, you know, and it's a fair sentiment. Uh, but literature has a rhetorical reality and, you know, if you're going to do that thing, as I hope to continue to do, uh, we need to be fair and, not try to, to, to control an audience by changing their expectations, but rather have realistic expecta expectations and meet the rhetorical situation, see it as it is, you know, reassess your goals. <laughs> Thank you. Our group went to the, uh, the previous Catholic Imag Imagination Conference, um, and there several writers uh, expressed displeasure with strictly Catholic readings of their work. Um, one author, in order to demonstrate the limits of religious approaches to literary criticism, turned to Virginia Woolf. She argued that given our knowledge of Woolf's life and beliefs, it would be absurd to impose religious readings on her novels. Uh, this reaction I found a bit odd. Um, if, one, we assume that art is medic, uh, and we normally do assume this. We assume we pick up a novel, the world posited by that novel reflects our own, unless we are told otherwise, um, unless the novel announces that it is a work of speculative fiction. And even then, in speculative fiction, uh, we assume that it deviates from our reality only to the degree made explicit by the novel. Uh, so one, if we assume that art is mimetic, and two, if we actually believe a religion is true, uh, for our purposes today, if we believe Catholicism to be true, um, then unless and until a novel itself informs us otherwise, we should assume that the world posited by that novel features a universe not just where matter accelerates when falling to Earth by 9.8 meters per second squared, not just a universe where Paris exists and George Washington led the Revolutionary Army, but also a universe created by an, an omnipotent triune God and a universe where across the globe, millions of human beings daily consume the flesh of the second person of that deity. Art holds up a mirror to the universe and uh, the belief of the person who held up that mirror has no necessary bearing on all of this. Uh, to torture the metaphor, even if uh, the author, the person holding that mirror to the universe is blind, that's not gonna change the, uh, the image in the mirror. Uh, the only way the image changes is if that mirror is intentionally uh, by a hand uh, distorted to some degree. If an author doesn't understand quantum mechanics and the novel does not explicitly reject contemporary understandings of quantum, quantum mechanics, then we assume that the novel posits a universe uh, which does mirror our own laws of physics. Why would we not assume the same of metaphysics? If the author of a novel professes a belief in moon landing or hollow earth conspiracies, but the novel concerns neither the moon nor Earth's mantle, uh, we don't try to read the novel in a way that incorporates the novelist's beliefs. We simply read on, passively assuming that the characters walk on solid ground. 
Why then would we not assume the existence of cooperating grace, the efficacy of sacraments, the hierarchy of angels, or the possibility of a purgatorial afterlife? If a person proclaims a belief in Catholicism, but they routinely default to an atheist, atheistic conception of the universe when approaching any text, I'm not exactly sure what they mean uh, when they say they believe in Catholicism. I'm not sure what their conception of belief is. Um, and a quick note here, I'm using, I'm borrowing a lot of uh, terms, I think, and phrasings from uh, reader response stuff, and I'm not really arguing for reader response based um, approach to literature here. The argument isn't that uh, Catholic readers create a Catholic world in conjunction with the text. The argument is that if Catholicism is true, then all texts, when written by anyone or uh, when read by anyone, are default uh, Catholic in some way. Uh, in our group, in the CCW, we've continually experimented with the books we read. Uh, we've questioned what a Catholic novel is or needs to be, whether the author uh, to be incorporated in our selection uh, needs to be a practicing Orthodox Catholic at the time of writing, uh, whether we can let the heretics in, uh, whether we can, um, whether a novel has to engage with thematically religious concerns, uh, whether it needs to feature explicitly Catholic characters, or uh, whether Catholicism needs to feature prominently in the plot. By reading a book at all in a specifically Catholic uh, literature discussion group, we to some degree impose the frame of Catholic literature onto the book, even if it is not popularly considered a Catholic, Christian, or religious novel. This uh, imposition and this selection has not always met with success in our group. Uh, it's not always led to interesting or useful readings or discussions, just as imposing a frame of scientifically accurate onto a novel may not actually lead to anything. Um, that previous example of gravity might not um, matter at all when we are approaching a text. Um, I want to just share with you uh, one instance where this kind of reading was extremely, extremely fruitful. Um, I hope to convince you that even if you think the good Catholic critic or good Catholic reader or the good reader in general should, approach, should not approach literature in the way I posed just now um, in their professional criticism, that at the very least in an informal setting uh, such as this book club, uh, this kind of approach might lead to good or useful discussions. Our case study is John Darnielle's debut novel, Wolf in White Van, which follows a game designer as he reflects on two moments of extreme violence in his life. Uh, the first, when he was a teenager, he uh, put a shotgun to his face and pulled the trigger and uh, miraculously survived, but permanently uh, was severely, horrifically disfigured. The second um, follows uh, the game designer, Sean, um, has uh, many, many followers, and two of them, two teenagers, Lance and Carrie, wander into the wilderness and dig a ditch, and uh, one of them, Carrie, freezes to death in that ditch, and they're inspired by um, part of the plot of his game to do this. Uh, the meandering, reflective narrative of this uh, novel is interrupted by text from the game. It's an odd play-by-mail uh, narrative cousin to choose your own adventure novels and Dungeons and & Dragons. This game... Trace Italian follows post-apocalyptic survivors as they try to journey towards the eponymous fortress, uh, which, uh, if it ever could be reached, and the game mechanics ensure it cannot, uh, would provide the players refuge against a harsh, irradiated post-apocalyptic world. The central question of the novel, the problem Sean himself grapples with, is uh, what is the responsibility of the artist uh, for the influence um, that his art could have on those who consume it. Sean's creation of Trace Italian is a necessary cause of the teenagers, Lance and Carrie, leaving home, heading north, and digging into the cold night. While the question can be considered within the context of religious philosophical traditions, it is obviously a question that can be considered without any such context. And I know of no review of Wolf and White Van, which considers it a religious novel, or which makes use of such context to understand it. Um, among many other things, John Darnielle was at one time a practicing Catholic, but his religious inclinations these days are vague and uncertain and changing. Um, he has before written explicitly religious material, but he's always very, very intentionally earmarked that material. Um, his Bible album has only songs named after Bible verses, for example. So uh, normally, normally it's very obvious when he wants you to um, 
engage with religion in his work. Religion only ever enters the narrative of Wolf and White Van uh, very briefly. Sean's accident occurs at the height of the satanic panic of the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, the novel itself was inspired by Darnielle's memories of the 1990 Judas Priest trial. And so two of the extremely brief references in the novel uh, to religion concern the panic. The third concerns Sean's high school friend who mentions at one point that she's a Christian. Sean remembers seeing a television program on TVN about satanic backmasking on records. And uh, he re recalls calling into the station. And in the second, um, second reference, he recalls uh, his own parents in the wake of what they call his accident. Uh, try to make sense of his actions by um, investigating rock music and fantasy and whether they can blame those things for um, Sean's actions. The satanic panic itself was ridiculous and the TBN conversation is hilarious. It's very much played for laughs. And uh, when Sean remembers his parents, uh, their investigation, he argues they were completely incorrect. Christianity then only appears to enter the novel as the happenstance trappings of ridicu or a ridiculous panic, which is used to make Carrie's parents seem, in turn, ridiculous. Panic about art in the past was ridiculous, and so too is it now. Such panics might involve religion, or they might not, and religion also need not motivate any such panics. Uh, Sean's Christian friend enjoys the same art that he does as a teenager and does not believe said art was involved in his attempted suicide. Christianity is entirely incidental and appears at all simply because this is a realistic novel set in the 1980s and the present day, and we live in a world where Christianity as an institution, a belief system, exists. The novel's ultimate response to the central question is also straightforward. Um, the novel seems to suggest that any attempt to find causal relationships between art and violence is as silly as a televangelist playing a Larry Norman record backwards and trying to find significance in sounds that vaguely sound like the nonsense phrase, wolf in white van. At the CCW, we approach the novel with the assumption that things like God, grace, sin, the human soul, heaven, hell, purgatory, angels, demons, Satan, the incarnation, maybe even the flying house of Loretto or visions of the holy prepuce, uh, depending on what parts of tradition, uh, lowercase t, you accept, uh, that all these things are actually real and our discussion was impacted as a result. Um, our discussion focused in large part on that scene where Sean calls into TBN. Uh, no matter how you approach that scene, we can all recognize it takes a turn at the end as Sean drifts from his memory into a kind of thought spiral as he so often does. Our approach didn't eliminate the psychological dimension of that term, which is the focus, I think, of most readings of the novel, uh, but it added a dimension which granted the scene additional weight. Um, I'm just going to read now how that scene where he calls into TBN concludes. The devil, I said, and I just let the word hang out for a minute in the air. Sean, said Carol, the TBN telephone operator who was supposed to be taking down people's pledges. Praise the Lord, the devil has no dominion over us. He tries to take back the good things the Lord has done for us, but he can't because that power isn't given in, into his dominion, amen? Uh, Sean continues to play at being possessed after this, and he scares himself with the noises he makes and the lines he improvises about uh, he drinks the blood of his slaves and he serves Satan and so on and so forth. And uh, when the operator eventually hangs up, he turns back to the television. Quote, I looked back over at the TV. Everybody has their eyes firmly fixed on the guest who is holding up more records by so many rock bands. He said the problem was everywhere. It was epidemic. But at that moment, all I could see was the wolf in the white van, so alive, so strong, hidden from view, unnoticed, concealed. And I thought, maybe he's real, this wolf. And he's really out there in a white van somewhere, riding around. Maybe he's in the far back, pacing back and forth, circling the pads of his huge paws, raw and cracking, his thick, sharp claws dully clicking against the raised, rusty steel track ridged on the floor. Maybe he's sound asleep, or maybe he's just pretending. And then the van stops somewhere, maybe, and somebody gets out and walks around the side to the back and grabs hold of the handle and flings the doors open wide. Maybe whoever's kept him wears a mechanic's jumpsuit and some sunglasses. And he hasn't fed the great wolf for weeks, cruising the streets of the city at night. And the wolf's crazy with hunger now. He can't even think. 
Maybe he's not locked up in the back at all. He could be riding in the passenger seat like a dog, just sitting and staring out the open window, looking around, checking everybody out. Maybe he's over in the other seat behind the steering wheel. Maybe he's driving. So when we approach this passage, we did so with the understanding that the image on which Sean fixates here might not just be the goofy nonsense of televangelists, the devil might be real. If that's the case, then the entire notion of spiritual warfare waged via art might not just be a punchline. The satanic panic might be to some degree justified, and Sean's art in turn might be a tool for evil. If we look for diabolical influence in his art, we can find it in one figure that pops up, uh, Marco. Marco is a recurring hallucination of Sean's in the days after his accident when the searing pain of the gunshot wound and the ocean of drugs with which the hospital uses to keep him alive leave him relatively untethered from reality. This is also the time when Sean begins to compose the text of his game, Trace Italian. Quote, years later, when they made me look at pictures of Lance and Carrie, I remembered Marco, the empty, incoherent prophecy I'd heard amid the chaos. For a second, as I flipped through the evidence, my long-forgotten hallucinations became real, and I wondered how he'd managed to remain hidden for so long. He dismisses the thought as he reflects further on that time. Quote, who made you do this, Sean? My father asked at my bedside, my hand in his. I thought then how nice it would have been to have a good answer ready to give. A little gift from son to father, something he could take to his friends by way of explanation, to blame Marco, to lay it at his feet, end quote. Now, in the discussion, we couldn't prove that Marco or the wolf in, white, in the white van were, in the text of the novel, real entities. Uh, we couldn't prove that diabolical forces used art to confuse young minds and tempt them to violence. And this is a good thing that we couldn't prove this. Uh, such a proof would probably make the novel far less interesting, would turn it into a chick tract. Uh, but allowing for the possibility of the demonic elevated our discussion of the novel, for it opened thematic discussions which would otherwise be shut. Again, if we can dismiss the satanic panic, as Sean does, uh, we should dismiss the uh, very heavily paralleled concerns raised by Carrie's parents. We should simply declare that in this novel, art is not the sort of thing that can be held responsible for violence. But if we allow the possibility, then we're actually forced to wrestle with the issue of responsibility. Was there something sinister in the art Sean consumed that influenced his decision to commit violence? Was there something sinister influencing Sean that led him to write a dangerous fiction? Complicating these questions further is the role of misreading in the novel. One of the earliest memories Sean recalls is of playing Conan, the barbarian, as a child. Quote, from my increasingly improbable perch, I looked toward the dark heavens somewhere up beyond the imagined cave ceiling, and I pantomimed the aspect of a man thinking hard about what he might want to eat. And then I looked back down to the present moment, and I spoke, I am King Conan, I said, I thirst for blood. Backyard Conan, thrown together from half-understood comic books only, took several liberties with the particulars. The Conan that the world knew didn't drink blood, wasn't ruthless and cold. He'd lived to follow a warrior's code of honor. The code was cruel, but just, consistent, coherent. When I became Conan, things were different. His new birth had left scars. I ruled a smoking, wrecked kingdom with a hard and deadly hand. It was dark and gory. No one liked living there, not even its king. It had a soundtrack, all screams. End quote. Even if the art itself is blameless, that art might be twisted to cruel ends. Here again, we don't need to turn to a satanic figure for an explanation of the wrong King Conan, but the possibility of such a figure usefully complicates an otherwise simple scene. If the problem here is merely childhood ignorance, Robert E. Howard is presumably blameless for Sean's suffering. If, however, art is something that can be twisted by diabolical forces, something that can be used to inflict suffering on unaware readers, then the situation alters. The former is comparable to the relationship between an electrician and electric shock by means of poking an outlet. The latter is comparable to a gun manufacturer and a shooting. 
Now, just as we allowed for the possibility of the demonic in this novel, so too we allowed for the possibility of something celestial. Our discussion was eventually dominated by a passage late in the novel that has not, to my knowledge, received much attention. In this passage, Sean remembers his first and last date. He goes to an arcade with his friend, Kimmy. Their conversation wanders. Quote, that was always something I liked about her. Uh, she talked about everything. End quote. And Kimmy asks if he's religious. Quote, I said I don't know, which was kind of true. When people said Jesus, it still always sounded to me like it had to mean something special, different from other words. I knew I didn't believe what Christians believed about how if you said the name, you would be saved. Saved from what? But still, when anybody said it and you heard it out loud, something always seemed to happen, a shift in the light, something about perspective. No matter how quiet they said it or whether they kept talking, it changed everything for a few minutes, end quote. Kimmy mentions that she is religious, and Sean then, quote, contemplated letting her into the dark, distant corners where Conan grew cruel and lived inside me, where I became a person with the power to blind strangers with a single gesture, where the dull edges of my life grew sharp enough to cut through rock. But instead, I kissed her, and she kissed me back, end quote. This scene takes place before Sean's accident, and we discussed here the possibility of real, actual, divinely given grace in this scene. Speaking the name of Jesus might not be a spell which automatically grants salvation. Sean might be right to disparage that position. But that change in the light might be the possibility for salvation, the offering of cooperating grace. Kimmy spoke Jesus' name, and in that moment, Sean considered sharing with her the dark corners of his soul, exposing those corners to that changed and changing light. If that moment is an opportunity for Sean to accept grace, and if that grace involved exposing those dark corners of his soul, this complicates the nature of his art further. It is those same corners which produce the Trace Italian. In his deposition, Sean describes his art thusly. Quote, I invented a world in the future, and I called it the Trace Italian. It was a place where I could have adventures, and when I grew up, I wanted to share those adventures with other people. I wanted specifically to share them with people like me, but I don't know any people like me. Most people like me are dead, end quote. It's possible that Sean's art is a source for grace. It is possible that Sean's art is diabolical. It's possible that both are the case. If we reject the possibility of supernatural dimensions to the novel, if neither the possible horrors of the wolf in the white van nor the grace of the invocation of Christ's name are real, the novel is still open in several ways. The reader still must face questions regarding the problem of evil, the nature of violence, the life of the disfigured in society, uh, but its approach to art is relatively closed. Art in the novel would just be escapist fantasy, a safe, pleasurable thing to enjoy, which is only dangerous if one approaches it in confusion or ignorance. If we approach the novel's posited world as one like that which the Catholic faith posits, then art is at the center of a spiritual warfare, and both artist and reader must enter into that combat. Both artist and reader are in danger of loss, but also may find victory. Both bear responsibility for their actions on that battleground, and both must carefully act to ensure that they are indeed advancing the cause of the heroes in that war. We left our discussion with questions, uh, and I think, um, this shows the usefulness of this reading that we are not leaving with, uh, with closed statements, but with open questions. And I'll leave you with our questions concerning the novel. How do we navigate this battleground? What are the precise responsibilities of the artist? How can artists best ensure that they serve virtue, not vice? How can they keep their powerful works, these weapons, these tools, from falling into the hands of the enemy, from being twisted to evil? Ultimately, how can we all avoid the great jaws of that prowling wolf? Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And last but not least, we have Bethany Besteman, who I should say has um, probably done the most to open up our reading list beyond the names we see, it, say, in the the and the program and, the, and the conferences like these. Um, so Bethany, go ahead. Thank you. 
Um, I've titled uh, this Catholic uppercase slash Catholic lowercase, uh, the effects of religious boundaries on community formation. So I will be doing my best to indicate which version of Catholic I'm referring to um, in this. CCW has repeatedly discussed and sometimes questioned the religious boundaries which shape our definition as a community. With regards to our book selections, CCW began with the useful boundary of reading works written by contemporary Catholic, uppercase, writers. However, over time and under the insidi insidious influence of the group's token Protestant, me, we have stretched that boundary to consider works by Catholic, lowercase, writers. Writers who engage with Christic motifs, themes, and narratives, but whose own faith is less firmly within Orthodox Catholicism and sometimes definitively outside of it. Just as CCW's community is aware of and wrestles with its religious boundaries, several of the works we have read deal thematically with that concern as well. Three novels in particular we've read over the last four years stand out as engaging with the issue of com community formation. La Rose by Louise Erdrich, The Ninth Hour, by Alice McDermott, and Gilead, by Marilyn Robinson. Admittedly, these novels' communities are defined not only by religion, but also by place, a small Iowa town, a North Dakota reservation, and Brooklyn, New York City. Family ties are also central to all of the novels. The strongest bond in all three books is that between a parent and a child. And the plots evolve out of the love and conflict that springs from this familial relationship. Nevertheless, religion provides the context within which other relationships and even the settings are formed. While all three novels reveal communities shaped by religious influences, each provides a different model for how to maintain religious boundaries. The Ninth Hour provides a model of sacrifice, Gilead one of sacrament, and La Rose one of syncretism. When taken together, we can see a path forward for successfully using religious boundaries in community formation and maintenance. Boundaries can motivate us to act and devote ourselves to our community. Boundaries can provide a space within which shared experiences deepen our community. And boundaries can, laid aside can expand the impact of our community. I will explore each model within the context of its novel before drawing some conclusions and practical applications for applying the models to a community like a book club or perhaps even a literary conference in which religious boundaries are important but occasionally problematic. The Ninth Hour considers the actions people take which determine their placement in an eternal community, heaven. In doing so, it reveals the remarkable devotion and sacrifice one human might make for another, but also offers a gentle critique of the suffering and anxiety that results from self-denial. The novel opens with Sister St. Savior's self-sacrificial visit to the grieving Annie and her efforts made on her behalf despite her own physical discomfort at the time. Quote, she had climbed the stone steps, footsore and weary and needing a toilet, but going up anyway, although no one had sent for her. Sister St. Savior's act of self-denial begins Annie's road to healing. This is community at its best, community supporting and lifting each other up in times of need. But her acts are also tinged with bitterness towards the church. 
She tries to cover up Jim's suicide, pushing against the boundaries for burial in the cemetery. Quote, she wanted him buried in Calvary because the power of the church wanted him kept out. And she, who had spent her life in the church's service, wanted him in. She bargains with God that he can put the sin of it on her ledger. Hold it against the good I've done, she says, negotiating with the boundaries, attempting to reposition them. When she fails to get Jim buried in the cemetery, she remarks, quote, it would be a different church if I were running it. The boundaries exist, but they lead to both acts of self-sacrificial charity to ensure Annie a place within them, and resentment because of those like Jim who are left outside. In other instances, in the novel, an act of self-sacrifice leads to resentment within the community. Sister Lucy's vocation came out of a childhood spent trying to atone for her father's sins. She says, quote, her heart clenched at what God asked of her, but she did not refuse. She sacrifices her desires to God's call, and as a result, Sally describes her as having a, quote, small, tight knot of fury at the heart of everything she does. Sister Lucy does her work well, but she does not do so joyfully. And in fact, her comments to Sally reveal her harsh judgment of the people she serves. She blames men for their treatment of women and women for their neglect of men. The community Sister Lucy creates is neither ideal nor broken. People are given a place and ministered to, but harmony and happiness are absent. The member of the convent who is described as being most at peace with the sacrificial logic of faith, Sister Jean, also presents the most troubling test case for this model. She considers, quote, fairness to be at the heart of faith. Quote, well, Sister Jean believed that fairness demanded this chaos be righted. Fairness demanded that grief should find succor, that wounds should heal, insult and confusion find recompense and certainty. Not only does this belief in fairness promise rewards for the suffering, it also means Sister Jean struggles to imagine grace at work despite sin. She believes Jim's soul is without hope. Quote, fairness made no claim for him. His death was a whim of his own, his own choice. Who, in all fairness, could demand its restitution? However, in the logic of substitutionary atonement, she also embraces the idea that one person's good life can atone for another person's sins. She proposes to Annie that her daughter Sally's religious vocation might cover Annie's sin in her affair with Mr. Costello. Quote, here's redemption, see? Here's forgiveness through his child, through her vocation. Here's the forgiveness of sins. The logic of faith, its strict rules and boundaries must be observed, but Sister Jean sees the ways by which one person can sacrifice themselves for another as bridges across those boundaries. By extension, if it is possible to do good on behalf of another, it is also possible to do evil on behalf of another. Sister Jean ends the book convinced through this logic of her own damnation. At the book's climax, just as Sally has made up her mind to damn herself and save her mother's soul by ending the life of the ill and ill-natured Mrs. Costello, Sister Jean prevents her from doing so by doing it herself. Speaking to Sally's children, the narrators of the story, she says, quote, I gave up my place in heaven a long time ago, out of love for my friends. Sister Jean's self-sacrifice opens the door for Annie and Sally to live without the burden of mortal sin, and for Annie to marry Mr. Costello. 
The community throughout the novel is made possible by such acts of self-sacrifice, self-denial, and substitutionary logic. Nevertheless, we are left uneasy. The narrators themselves note that the nun's call to sanctity and self-sacrifice required delusion and superstition to be sustained both of which are fading, and the close-knit communities created by the convents are fading with them. The sacrificial model thus encourages industry and action, but it demands much of its members. Gilead is also concerned with the eternal, but it brings the eternal forward into the temporal through characters who, in rejecting eternal communion, also reject temporal communion with their families and friends, most notably Jack Boughton. Unlike the ninth hour's logic of faith, in Gilead, what defines the community and who belongs in it are never explained. The beauty of the community and the pain of those broken away from it are discussed by the narrator, Reverend John Ames, not in logical terms, but in emotional and experiential ones. The images Ames returns to throughout his narrative as he contemplates the mystery of community are the two sacraments of his reformed faith, communion and baptism. Baptism for Ames connects him to the baptized through the act of blessing. Early in the novel, Ames recounts a childhood incident which he and Jack's father, Reverend Robert Boughton, decided to baptize a litter of kittens. Quote, I still remember how those warm little brows felt under the palm of my hand. Everyone has petted a cat, but to touch one like that with the pure intention of blessing, it is a very different thing. There is a reality in blessing, which I take baptism to be primarily. It doesn't enhance sacredness, but it acknowledges it. And there is a power in that. I have felt it pass through me, so to speak. The sensation is of really knowing a creature. I mean, really feeling its mysterious life and your own mysterious life at the same time, end quote. It is notable that for Ames, really knowing is equated with really feeling. Knowledge and sensation are indistinguishable in the context of this sacrament. Moreover, baptism remains something mysterious to even Ames, who has baptized infants his whole life. He recalls his bewilderment after baptizing his wife, Lila. Quote, I felt like asking her, what have I done? What does it mean? Not because I felt less than certain that I had done something that did mean something, but because no matter how much I thought and read and prayed, I felt outside the mystery of it. Baptism is never discussed in doctrinally confident terms, but is undertaken despite the limits of human understanding. Ames' striking sense of wonder at the act of baptism is consistent with his character throughout the novel. He marvels, wonders, and delights in the physical world as he anticipates departing it soon. Sensation is precious to him, which is why he laments his distracted attitude during Jack's baptism when he, quote, didn't feel that sacredness under my hand that I always do feel, the sense that the infant is blessing me. There is a mutuality that Ames senses in baptism. It benefits not just the one who is blessed, but also the one who blesses. Communion likewise binds Ames to other members of his community, as well as to the church universal. His earliest memory of communion connects Ames to his own father when they worked in the rain to tear down a burnt church. I remember my father down on his heels in the rain, water dripping from his hat, 
feeding me biscuit from his scorched hand with that old blackened wreck of a church behind him. Grief itself has often returned me to that morning when I took communion from my father's hand. I remember it as communion, and I believe that's what it was. Ash and the sorrow it represents are part of Ames' understanding of the church in communion. He has lived through times of great destitution in his community and has endured tremendous grief in the loss of his wife and daughter. Thus, he sees something beautiful in brokenness. Quote, I have nothing to give you. Take and eat. Ashy biscuit, summer rain, hair falling wet around her face. The ash, however, is not merely sorrow. It is evidence of fire and promise of its return. It's only a short step from ash to ember, which is the final image Ames leaves us with as he pictures his mortal body as an ember smoldering away the time until the great and general incandescence. Moreover, communion does not merely offer hope to the sorrowful. It unites the church to the Holy Catholic Church. Ames acknowledges the limitations of his lived experience. He nevertheless asserts the transcendent power of faith to overcome boundaries of space and time. Quote, and I know, too, that my own experience of the church has been, in many senses, sheltered and parochial. In every sense. Unless it really is a universal and transcendent life. Unless the bread is the bread, and the cup is the cup everywhere, in all circumstances. And if it is a time with the Lord in Gethsemane that comes for everyone as I deeply believe, that biscuit, ashy from my father's charred hand. If I could only give you what my father gave me, know what the Lord has given me and must also give you. Ames sees the mystery of his faith captured in the mystery of the sacrament. He recognizes that a place within this community of faith, affirmed by baptism and communion, is due to the will and grace of God. Sacrament is where free will meets God's sovereignty. It is where the eternal touches the temporal, and it is where the spiritual reality intersects with the physical reality. This is what amazes and astounds Reverend Ames throughout the book, the mystery of God's work in the world and man's frailty and difficulty in understanding it. The sacraments also pave the road to healing broken relationships. Ames' troubled relationship with Jack is shown restored through the act of blessing, an echo of his baptism. He closed his eyes and lowered his head, almost rested it against my hand, and I did bless him to the limits of my powers, whatever they are, repeating the benediction from numbers, of course. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In blessing Jack, he allows the spiritual and the physical, the temporal and the eternal, free will and sovereignty to meet in that moment. We are left with no proofs of faith, but merely and sufficiently with hope. Thus, the sacrament model deepens its community through shared experiences. Boundaries exist organically because they are what draws members together. The rose, by contrast with both Gilead and the Ninth Hour, does not display anxiety about the eternal. Religion and tradition are portrayed as ways and means that can be employed to achieve earthly harmony and heal earthly brokenness. The test of a religion is whether it works in this regard. Thus, religions are capable of working together, so long as they don't insist on firm boundaries between heaven and earth, in and out. The third sentence of the book asserts that Landro Iron, the father of the titular character, is both Native American traditional and Catholic. 
Catholic and traditional remedies are applied to much of the brokenness in the book. The central brokenness results from Landro's hunting accident in which he shoots and kills his neighbor's four-year-old son, Dusty Ravage. Initially, Landro and his wife, Emmeline, seek counsel and comfort from their priest. Father Travis Wozniak held their hands and prayed. He didn't think he would find the words, but they came. Of course, words came. Incomprehensible, his judgments, unsearchable, his ways. What should we do, Emmeline asked now. How can things go on? Emmeline held Landro. They murmured another round of Hail Marys together. The repetition quieted them again. Although stunned and shaken by the tragedy, Father Travis offers them a space to be vulnerable and to find comfort. After leaving Father Travis, Landro and Emmeline perform a sweat lodge ceremony. Well, Emmeline had songs for bringing in the medicines, for inviting in the Manaduk, the spirits. Landro had songs for the animals and winds who sat in each direction. They sang to the beings they had invited to help them, and they sang to their ancestors, the ones so far back their names were lost. After the ceremony, they come to the heart-wrenching decision to give their own four-year-old son, LaRose, to the grieving Ravitch family. In doing so, they tell Peter and Nola Ravitch that this is the old way, a traditional form of justice. Nevertheless, the act has weight within Christic traditions as well. LaRose is an innocent, beloved son, given in atonement for sins and to bridge an otherwise unbridgeable gulf. LaRose thus joins the two families, who might otherwise have been forever divided by grief and the desire for revenge. LaRose is also a symbol of the coming together of cultures, being descended from a line of women for whom he is named, who possessed remarkable spiritual powers, but who were also forced or chose pragmatically to adapt to a white culture. Thus, the book presents a community whose brokenness is slowly healed, not through imposing boundaries, but through crossing them. Indeed, Catholicism is shown to thrive on the reservation, but only insofar as its leading representative, Father Travis, is willing to adapt himself and his methods to the people he serves. You've got to catch them in the weeds, he said. To the weak I became weak, that I might gain the weak. I became all things to all men, that I might save all. If Father Travis had a tattoo, it would be the words of the Apostle Paul. He builds an athletic obstacle course in the churchyard, and instead of catechism, he teaches taekwondo. He can be found in the confessional, as well as in dive bars. As a result, he interacts with the entire community. The ravishes, ravishes come to him as well as the irons. Romeo, the book's antagonist, confides in him, as well as the rose, the protagonist. In response, he supports, encourages, and intervenes when necessary. When the new bishop decides to transfer Father Travis at the end of the novel, it is understood that a time of success for Catholicism at the reservation is coming to an end. His replacement, the unfortunately named Father Dick Boner, says things will be changing around here and rejects Father Travis's advice about going by the name Father Richard. He is described as, quote, wearing an elaborate medieval pre priest outfit with chain for a belt and shoes that looked like carpet slippers. He was from a newly formed order. Erdrich pokes not too subtle fun at the irony of a new order insisting on traditional Catholic dress and boundaries. The subtle jab at the inflexibility implied by his in appearance and the brief clipped dialogue between the two priests suggests that Father Travis leaves the reservation in the hands of someone who will struggle to fill his shoes. In fact, the final scene of the book, there is a graduation party for Romeo's son, Hollis, who has grown up in the Iron family. The final scene reveals the fruits of the last several years as the Ravitch and Iron family, and even Romeo, the perpetual outsider who has done everything in his power to divide the Irons and the Ravitches further, comes together to 
celebrate Hollis. However, Father Dick is absent. Just before the cake cutting, the narrator remarks, ordinarily, at this moment, they would have asked Father Travis to say a prayer. Nobody had thought of asking the new priest. People resented having been assigned a priest named Father Boner, as if, where else could he go? And you couldn't call him Father Dick. It wasn't right. Father Travis's adaptability, which made him respected and welcome in every home, has been replaced with Father Dick's inflexibility, making him someone the community cannot respect. Thus, the syncretic model for community has an open border policy. It employs faith to draw people together and to heal brokenness, but it can only do so if those who participate in the community forego their right to exclusivity, to boundaries. Faith cannot be the defining factor of such a community. Rather, faith can assist in the community. If that faith ceases to be useful or if it resists compromise, it risks rejection. So, having examined these three models for religiously inflected communities within the novels, I will now consider how they might inform the conversation about creating religiously inflected discourse communities like book clubs or even literary conferences. In CCW, elements of all three models have interacted over the years. I see the sacrifice model of community most at work in the efforts of our founder and those of us who have taken up various leadership roles. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few, and thus the work demanded of us is greater. We are committed to the creation of this community and to the Catholic, uppercase, focus we have chosen to maintain but we spend a great amount of time advertising and inviting, planning, and requesting support, financial and otherwise. The narrow focus of our group means we have a unique niche on campus, but it also means we do not have a broad base of support that would make us self-sustaining. Despite the sacrifice of time and efforts, we do have sacramental moments, moments in which we experience the transcendental effects of literature. It brings us out of our individual lives and connects us to each other and to the common human experience. There are a few things more sacramental, other than the sacraments themselves, than the communion that comes from the shared delight in a passage or a poem which reveals yourself to yourself and tells you, no, you are not alone. I'm there with you. Your sorrow is mine, and so is your joy. The syncretic work of discerning which boundaries to cross remains a challenge to us. We cross boundaries of academic and non-academic every month as our group attracts graduate and undergraduate students, even the occasional faculty member, but also significantly staff, alumni, and several people who have no affiliation with our university. Recently, we have started to cross boundaries of medium and also space by creating a podcast, which has been met with some enthusiasm. However, other boundaries look more intimidating. Do we remain a graduate student initiative with loose ties to the English department? If so, what happens when we cease to be graduate students? Do we find a permanent home with permanent sources of support on CUA's campus? Do we reach out and create a new space outside of the academy? These boundaries continue to perplex us. As for our religious boundaries, we've instituted summers of schism, in which I'm allowed to suggest as many non-Catholic, uppercase, books as I want. During these summers, we have encountered some extraordinary works, which test our commitment to Catholic, uppercase, literature. I come from a tradition which takes a broad view of faith in literature. One of our theologians, Abraham Kuyper, famously said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. That is a truly Catholic, lowercase, boundary that I find exhilarating. Thank you.
Thank you all. Uh, we did go over time, so I think we only have a few minutes, 10 minutes left for questions, but we can always continue the conversation uh, afterwards. If I was to wrap everything up here, I think um, uh, the, the main question of the group, so the, the initiation of the group came from the excitement over the idea of contemporary Catholic writers. And let's get together and read them and find out who they are. In practice though, day to day, what that actually means, so the title of our group, the title of this conference, um, that's more difficult to define. It's, it seems like it's very dynamic, it's always changing. Uh, I remember at the first Catholic Imagination Conference, there's a panel, and I think the, the, um, the topic of the panel was defining the Catholic literary imagination. It was James Matthew Wilson, Joshua Wren, and Randy, Bo Randy Boyagoda. And uh, some woman in the back stands up. It was a very fiery uh, discussion. And um, some woman stood up in the back um, protesting sort of the, um, the strict boundaries that were being proposed. So that's, we're trying to continue that conversation today. So we'd like to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I th I'm going to be wordy in my response because I'm still taking a lot in. But I think I'm touching on all three topics, reader response and Catholic, uh, Orthodox, what it is to be the religion as true, and then the crossing boundaries. I myself am a Catholic sister, so I'm going to give my reader response background, picking up one of those themes, and also a theologian, retired theologian, that taught at the Ecumenical School of the Toronto School of Theology. So uh, I guess my questions on the interpretive or the innuendo side, because uh, Catholic, of course, capital C, in includes a massive strand of interpretation. So when I listen to some of the comments, I'm saying, but that's not fully it. See, I'm responding from my knowledge and from my, so for instance, I identify much more with baptism as blessing and communion as so on than I do with these nuns who have this satisfaction theory. Because I know where the satisfaction theory came from. I know why it happened, you know, slavery back in the 10 hundreds and trying to bring some meaning. But it's a, such a limited view of the gracious, unbounded, <laughs> without conditions sense of who God, who God is that is in polar tradition. So I guess I don't know what my question is. It's just that I res responded a little bit saying, well, I'm going, to re I'm going to react to Alice McDermott for these, this picture of these nuns, uh, because I'm a nun, and that isn't my experience. But I know sisters or people who are not sisters with that satisfaction theology, you know? So would you, would you talk a little bit about that? I don't even know if I make sense of my question. But. Well, I, I, this is why I specifically did not call it a Catholic model and a Protestant model of community, because I felt that same way that that these, these models represented the novels, the, the, tr the, the, the community within a particular novel, not necessarily the, the truth about a, 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 um, a, a faith profession. Um, so that's why I was trying to say that I see these models at work and in various communities, but not that I'm saying that Catholic is the sacrifice and Protestant is the Gilead. I, I think there is tremendous overlap. You find Protestant communities with very strong senses of who's in and who's out and, and very strong rules, uh, just like you, I think, find the opposite in, in Catholic communities. So I was rather trying to say that I think these different models are, are at work and are, are things we should consider uh, rather than trying to label one Catholic. I would just add the interesting thing I've been able to observe is that right the the title Catholic writers draws a lot of people in, but it also everyone comes in with their different dispositions, their backgrounds, their assumptions, and the group has really been a sort of a working through all of that together. Yeah. When you create a story and characters, essentially, uh, part of what you're doing is it's a grand experiment. 
you put these people in the, these certain people in this certain situation with certain beliefs or assumptions that they hold, and then you allow the story to go to its logical conclusion. And in a way, it's a way of exploring, okay, what if we really do believe this? Where does this take us? Or what if we really do assume this? Where does this take us? And uh, often the characters themselves hit their own boundaries at which you hope the reader's kind of gone there with them and realized, you know, the satisfaction thing doesn't really work out that well or some other kind of conclusion. Uh, so I, I think that writers lead um, through imagination and through characters that we relate to lead us right up to the boundaries all the time. And I think you're good uh, writers of faith. I'm not even going to say Catholic Protestant, but uh, writers who allow their faith to really inform the writing. That's just what naturally is going to happen. What if, what if I really do believe this? Then how is that going to influence how I interact with this situation? Any other questions? Thanks, another former Catholic University of America person here. Uh, watching the film Flannery last night, which was extraordinary, it came to me again and again how something about the Catholic imagination includes a kind of openness to the epiphany of grace as a paradox. Uh, and um, I'm wondering uh, uh, whether the paradoxical nature of grace has anything to do with this kind of fraught, um, radical center you're trying to get at. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll begin the answer, I guess. Um, I'm trying to write a dissertation on the grotesque in mid 20th century Catholic fiction, which includes O'Connor, obviously. And um, the grotesque, the more I read about it, the more I study it, the more I don't know what it is. Because it's often this thing over here and its opposite coexisting. They're both true. Um, and I feel like that's the way a lot of our discussions of various books, from Alice McDermott to Marilyn Robinson, have gone, um, where we see uh, a work in one way and also its opposite and I think as a group, we've just become more comfortable with um, not just paradox, but the ambiguity um, that comes with paradox. And as O'Connor would say, the um, comfort with mystery or resting in mystery that perhaps, you know, there's, there's the, there are the boundaries, they're porous, we can only get so far. So I don't know if you guys want to jump in on that but I mean I'm, I'm just increasingly um, I mean I think all of us were dealing with um, on some level something that presented a binary that we we eventually tried to try to break down a little bit and it's that yeah trying to find you know traditional non-traditional religious non-religious text um, Catholic or Catholic right this sense that yeah I think there is a, it, it seems an impossible thing to resolve on some level but through discussion and through what the group, I think we've, we've found it, we don't resolve things. I think, as Rob said, it's, it's not so much that we you know, find a resting spot where we're very happy and like we've solved the mystery of wolf and white van, um, but we've, we've come up with better questions to ask. We've come up with new ways to, to ask questions about other texts and new ways to think um, about the things that drive us as, as you know, PhD students who are studying literature. Uh, we've definitely wrestled with that. I know you want to jump in, but I want to say something real quick. Uh, for me, in starting the group, I, I purposely used the capital C to draw the, in the kinds of people who are looking for that. Who, and in drawing those people in, then we lowercase it. Um, so that's, that's a different a different direction. Um. Sure, yeah. I would say uh, 
if we think about, for example, the connotative reality of a situation like that, uh, when you invite texts in, in that lowercase c sense, let's say you invite Protestant writers in or a very wide variety of, of Catholic authors, uh, I think it is important to account for, um, uh, or to wonder, let me state that over again. Whatever connotative network you've grown up with, uh, or, or whichever quantitative network you formed for yourself, that's going to, of course, affect the kinds of questions and comparisons you make, right? I, uh, I, uh, and so I. Uh, We're early. What? Did, yeah. Sorry, I only had two hours of sleep last night. I, I do wonder. At what point, what, what do we achieve, for example? So we can acknowledge, for example, uh, all right, I figured out, maybe in sh I shared my opinion. Maybe I found out that you have a different connotative network than I do. You know, maybe certain binaries strike you in different ways. Maybe Louise Erdrich, maybe that inspired you to feel like a rebel, like, yeah, that tratty priest in it, isn't he so rigid? Whereas maybe another person would say, Oh, Louise Erdrich is being so mean to me. You know, I'm that tratty Catholic who who's totally thinks that the, uh, an authoritative method would perhaps be actually the best for that community. So, uh, uh, to what extent are we, uh, when we create those boundaries, just reaffirming our own network of associations that we already knew about before? You know, we can acknowledge those, but do we really? I, I, do we really change that network? How often do we really change the constellation of our feelings and reactions? We slightly revise them, I would argue. Otherwise, popular authors I, I wouldn't follow conventions so closely. They need to follow those conventions because that's the expectation, because readers typically respond in predictable ways based on the arrangements of, of their, the constellation of their connotation. I don't know if that made sense, but I, I wonder what is the intention behind any, any choice of boundaries? Is it to just acknowledge connotation? We, uh, uh, and what does that achieve? Okay, you shared your network, I shared my network, but if we didn't agree, if we didn't get anywhere, to what extent are we actually a community? Or is it an illusion of a community that we just agreed to share and therefore we're somehow more united. What do you mean by normative? I don't But if you disagree, you see a wholly different meaning in the text. Pardon? Yeah. Well, truth, goodness, beauty, but that's my associative network. You might not agree with that, and that's okay, because that's just the rhetorical reality of literature. But that's my conviction. So as a teacher, I'm going to teach my convictions. And I would expect you to do that too, I, I suppose, but I might not agree with the way you do it, and I might argue that you shouldn't do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that has to be our last one, right? Yeah. I'll make it quick. Um, I'm writing on both Virginia Woolf and Marilyn Robinson, so I've been enjoying this quite a bit. Curious, you talk, Jessica, you talked about the grotesque as sort of resolving, you know, from all over the place. Or Bethany, not or, resolving. <laughs> yeah. Do do any of you make anything of the the so-called trilogy of Robinson with Lila Holm and Gilead? It's not really a trilogy so much as three different views of kind of the same rough narrative and very different interpretations about like Lila's baptism, for example. Uh, do I make something of it? Sorry. What would you make of these different accounts? Maybe maybe we can talk over lunch about it. Um, I mean, I've read all three. We've talked about just Gilead in this group, but uh, in other contexts, a couple of us have talked about the other books. Um, yeah, I think I'd have to think a little more, and maybe we could talk about that, because I, I don't have anything off the top of my head that relates directly to this, this uh, set setting and situation. But I, I would love to chat about them. They are my favorite books. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, everyone. We hope to continue the conversation if you're interested. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you.